Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the issue of US-China relations uh, speak series. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is Institute for US-China Issues at the College of International Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And my name is Zhu Zhang and I'm the Newman Postdoc Fellow at Institute. And I will be served as the monitor uh, for today's event. So before I introduce our speaker, um, I would like to thank the generous uh, sponsorship of the Institute at OU and also logistical support from the Department of International and Area Studies. And we are delighted to have Dr. Dennis Simon as our speaker today. And Dr. Simon is senior advisor to the uh, President for China Affairs at Duke University and also professor of China Business and Technology at Duke's Fuqua School of Business. So he is a very well-known scholar who works on business, competition, innovation, and technology strategy in China. And he has a numerous uh, list of publications, which I'm going to skip the long list of his uh, influential publications uh, for, for today, since it will take the entire day to do so. Um, but beyond the scholarship, Dr. Dennis Simon also has uh, extensively uh, 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 leadership uh, experience in higher education, both in US and Asia, and also tremendous knowledge and experience in management consulting business as well. So he is also the uh, recipient of the China National Friendship uh, Rewards, which was uh, rewarded by Premier Wen Jiabao in person in 2006. So today we will have a conversation with him on the uh, China's science and technology s and uh, and also uh, the role of s and in the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So since scholars and the policymakers around the world have pointed out that China's Belt and Road Initiative is enrolling into the road of uh, s and that helps China's technology to the world benefiting more and more countries and people around the world. Others, however, argue that China is using the initiative to reshape the rules and the regulations of s and as well as global higher education in order to achieve its political and uh, diplomatic ends. So today we'll have a golden opportunity to have uh, Dr. Dennis Simon's insight on the expanded role of science and technology and education in China's uh, Built and Road Initiative and plus imp uh, implementations for uh, the US. So if you have any questions around uh, the talk, please post it on the uh, Q&A box down the screen. And uh, Dr. Simon will talk about 15 minutes. So, and after that, um, I will uh, collect all the questions from the Q&A box and we'll have a further discussion on China's s and policy and also US-China technology relations in general. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Dennis Simon. Thanks a lot, Ju, and uh, thank you to the organizers, uh, Professor Bokong and uh, the uh, members of the uh, center. I'm uh, really appreciative of the opportunity uh, to talk to you. Um, I, like a lot of people, I've been following what goes on with the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, over the last uh, year and a half or so, I began to notice some uh, big changes going on in the complexion of that. And what I thought I would do is uh, talk to you about that today. As you can see from the cover slide, uh, there are already lots of books and uh, articles and journals all written about the Belt and Road, everyone trying to understand uh, the broader implications. And uh, hopefully I can give you a sense of some of this by looking at the new face of the BRI in terms of the expanded role of science and technology and education as tools or instruments of, the, of Chinese diplomacy. So I will talk a little bit about BRI. I'll uh, look at the s and and education perspective, uh, discuss a bit about the COVID-19 uh, impact, and then look at some of the challenges and issues and particularly uh, discuss where I think it's headed and what those implications might be for the United States as it uh, looks ahead in the coming uh, months and years. So uh, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, earlier this year uh, published a, uh, a study uh, looking at the implications of the Belt and Road. And I thought one of the most important findings uh, that they came uh, to was that they said the, the BRI, Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy undertaking is being recalibrated for a post-COVID world. 
The building of roads, railways, ports, power plants is giving way to a BRI centered on technology, primarily telecommunications, uh, connectivity, healthcare, and financial services. China will also have to contend with the debt and environmental burdens that accompany BRI's signature infrastructure projects. So I think that the, this began to see that uh, there's been a kind of transition uh, in, in the way the Chinese are approaching uh, BRI. And uh, I hope to explain a little bit about what's been happening and why, why it happened. Uh, Minister Wang Chugang, who's the head of the Ministry of Science and Technology um, uh, in, uh, in 2019, talked a little bit about China's goal for making the BRI into a so-called Silk Road of Innovation. And he said that uh, uh, today, a new round of scientific revolution and industrial transformation is accelerating around the world. And that uh, China is not only the beneficiary of globalization, but increasingly, uh, uh, you know, he, it's also a contributor and leader in terms of uh, innovation cooperation. And China stands ready to join hands with all the countries uh, for building the Belt and Road into a road of innovation. And so this kind of gets you uh, to understand how China has begun to see itself, not just as a taker, but also as a contributor. And uh, I'm, I by no means want to suggest that this is done out of altruism. This is all done as a kind of strategic perspective about how China needs, needs to better cement its relations with the countries along the Belt and Road. Uh, sometimes, as you know, they say that there are 65 countries, sometimes 70, sometimes all the way up to 140 different countries. So uh, the Belt and Road is an expansive concept. It is not limited uh, uh, by any means. Uh, it's it's an um, uh, area of convenience, you might say. Um, in 2021, Xi Jinping uh, um, uh, made another big speech about international s and cooperation. And one of the most important things he said in that speech is that we must implement a more open, a more inclusive, a more mutually beneficial, and a shared international science and technology cooperation strategy. It's necessary to promote international s and exchanges and cooperation with more open thinking and measures. And I think that what uh, she is referring to is that China has to show greater sensitivity to the local areas in which it wants to work, uh, because China cannot simply impose what it needs on these countries if it hopes to have a long-term sustainable relationship with the countries that belong to this Belt and Road area. And we've seen from phase one, uh, in many cases, that there has been uh, uh, lots of pushback from these countries as they've done a stock taking of the consequences of what it's meant to collaborate with China, uh, both the good and the bad, and sometimes even the ugly. So, so Xi Jinping in 2021 already is already taking note that China must change its posture and must alter its approach. And I think this is what's going on. Now, in terms of understanding uh, the role of education as well as science and technology, I think we have to look at both science diplomacy and education diplomacy, because they are both the instruments that China now is depending on to improve the, its relationship with the countries of the Belt and Road. So there's something called, if you see down here in number three, science for diplomacy, and that is that using science as a tool to improve relations with the BRI countries. But there's also something called diplomacy for science, and that is the effort to uh, facilitate science and technology collaboration with these countries, because there is a common interest or shared interest in working with these countries in the area of science and technology. And then finally, there's something called science in diplomacy. That is the way that scientific advice is being provided to foreign policy makers and decision makers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the BRI countries. So the same thing is at work with respect to education, education for diplomacy, diplomacy for education, and education in diplomacy. And I think we want to keep that in mind, that China, again, not by altruism, by but strategic thinking about how it can cement better ties with the BRI countries. And it's using now two instruments it had not utilized uh, as effectively as it might have before science and technology on the one hand, and higher education cooperation on the other hand. So when the BRI began all the way back in 2013, um, uh, there were two dimensions of it. There was the Silk Road Economic Belt, 
and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. And uh, you can see here from this chart uh, that the forging greater BRI multilateral relationships through science and technology collaboration has now become an integral part of the tools that the Chinese government is using in, in terms of building better relations. Uh, cultural exchange is part of that. Financial integration is, though we know that China has been criticized severely for debt diplomacy uh, and emphasis on creating too much debt uh, dependence. Uh, nonetheless, it's also part of the strategy. And today we see six major priority areas uh, in terms of BRI, infrastructure, policy, cultural, and s and ties between the major uh, BRI countries and China. And s and is playing a much more critical role as this picture starts to evolve over time. So you can see here the, the two uh, general pictures. One, uh, the land route of the so-called uh, Belt and Road uh, that starts somewhere around Xi'an and goes all the way uh, uh, through the Middle East and into uh, Europe, through Eastern Europe. And we see the Maritime uh, uh, Silk Road. When I was the executive vice chancellor of Duke Quinchon University, we were invited by Xiamen University to join a consortium of countries uh, working as part of the Maritime Silk Road. And I went to another, a number of meetings in which they discussed ways in order to build out this Maritime Silk Road, which of course is trying to take advantage of the water routes uh, that would bring Chinese uh, traders, Chinese business uh, into this whole area of the world that uh, really um, for China had not been a mainstream area, but gradually, but steadily, it has become such. And so I think the Chinese are starting to see that there's a whole part of the global economy that had been on the margins of that economy. And China is trying to make this much more central, both in terms of its interests and both in terms of its importance uh, in terms of global economic and science and technology affairs. And uh, this is what's been going on over the last, uh, uh, I'd say, approximately two years. Uh, there are six key corridors to this, and I'm not going to get into the, the, the detail about uh, every element, but you can see that the Belt and Road is a very complex um, uh, initiative. It involves over 31,000 kilometers of railroad track and over 12,000 kilometers of roads. So it is really is building out the infrastructure in a part of the world that obviously had suffered uh, from lack of this kind of infrastructure. Uh, even in places like Xinjiang, uh, it's trying to connect Xinjiang with uh, other areas of the globe. Now, uh, there are some sensitivities involved in this, and we can talk about that later on. But uh, I think it's, again, it's just important to see that uh, this is a, a big strategic initiative for China that uh, carries lots of importance as Chinese leaders look to the future of their global engagement. Now, I think if we want to take this even one step further, I uh, uh, was reading a little bit by uh, Claude uh, Albagaili, and uh, he wrote an article in which he suggested that the BRI is the basic restructuring of globalization, and that what we're seeing is a departure from what some thought would be a linear extrapolation. That is that uh, the linear extrapolation was very Western centric in terms of globalization, but the globalization that's occurring as a result of BRI, he said, that, you know, there are three new channels that have opened up to reconfigure trade, uh, value chains and financial transactions. One built around Asian integration circle, a second one built around Central Asia and East Africa, and then an entirely new system of transnational digital energy and uh, health infrastructure networks that are designed to increase the connectivity of these BRI countries with the rest of the world. And one of the most important areas that I would contend that makes all of this so interesting is the area of technical standards. This is where China basically is working with these countries to shape their decision making about choosing standards like for 5G technology that would be much more akin and in alignment with the Chinese preference rather than American or European preferences. And there is, a, to be very honest, the kind of danger here that we will see a bifurcation of the world 
uh, into, in a sense, a Chinese-driven set of tech standards and a Western or American-driven set of tech standards. And that's very possible, particularly given U.S. pressures now on China to follow a more self-reliant uh, uh, posture in terms of the Chinese economy and uh, technology system. So why did the BRI develop in the first place? Um, and where does it come about? I think that one of the things that we have to remember, and uh, I'll, I'll mention this in a minute, is that the BRI is not only a foreign policy initiative for China, but it's also a domestic initiative. That is that China has always been concerned about the gap between the coast and the interior. And of course, as we know, during the era of Mao Zedong, uh, there were very strict limits on rural to urban migration. The hukou system was established, and there was a great, you know, deal of concern. In fact, you know, when when the West first came to China in 1850, um, you you know that the China basically ended up in this bifurcated coastal China, which became the Treaty Port China, and then the interior. And even under Deng Xiaoping the uh, development of the so-called 14 coastal cities really was not much different than what happened during the uh, period of the 19th century, where coastal China was to provide trickle-down development uh, for the interior. But this has not always happened. And so China recognized by developing Western China and linking it into a new dynamic economic area, it might give impetus to more rapid development of the Western part of China. This is not unimportant because we know that China has spent a lot of time and attention making sure that everything from foreign investment uh, to investment in education is now increasing in that part of the country. Um, the BRI is also important because uh, by expanding trade routes, it is supposed to uh, provide new markets for China to utilize its excess economic capacity, particularly the capacity of SOEs uh, to produce products that may not be world-class, but may be good enough for some of the economies in this part of the world. And sure enough, in fact, uh, the trade relationships between China and the BRI countries has expanded very steadily. And I'll show you some results in a, in a few minutes. Also, the same thing you know, in terms of um, building the investment infrastructure outside of the direct orbit of the United States and Western Europe. This is an area where the US and Western Europe hasn't traditionally paid a lot of, of attention. And right now, China it considers it to be a high priority area, particularly because of its supply of critical raw materials and energy resources to support Chinese economic growth. So uh, we're in a very important part of the world. Um, and even though it does not have the development trajectory at this time, uh, of the more industrialized countries, it promises to take on added importance. The more attention that China gives it, the more concern I would argue that the West is going to give it. So here's my point, what I meant. If you look at the three lower blue circles, you'll see uh, Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei is one coordinated development plan initiative. Uh, the Pearl River and so-called Bay Area in Southern China with Hong Kong is a second. The Yangtze River Economic Belt is a third. And I would argue that the fourth is the Belt and Road Initiative that involves the buildup of Western China. And uh, this includes everything from you know, Lanzhou and Gansu all the way out to Xinjiang and Tibet. So uh, we know that these are very politically sensitive areas for China. And so they need to see that development occurs here in order to uh, win over the hearts and mind of the people that the communist regime in effect is supplying um, support in economic terms and uh, infrastructure terms uh, to this part of the, uh, the, of the country. So very important. Uh, by early 2021, China had signed over 205 BR, BRI cooperative agreements with over 140 countries and uh, 31 international agencies. Um, and we can see that the bulk of these, interestingly, have been with Africa. And uh, the next ones have been with Asia. So clearly, this is... Uh, uh, consistent with where we've seen Chinese resource diplomacy and energy diplomacy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, um, uh, the BRI is very much in alignment with the posture of China and how it's playing throughout the rest of the world. 
And these are just some data to basically to support. You can see from the blue line here, the blue bars, the total volume of imports and exports to the BRI countries is increasing. And uh, the BRI countries as a percentage of Chinese total volume of trade also is increasing. So we can see that these countries are taking on a more important role in terms of their engagement with China. And uh, there was a study done in August 2020 uh, that was produced in a journal called Sustainability, uh, in which the authors uh, say that they see that the trade of China with the BRI countries has become preferentially linked since the implementation of the BRI. And in particular, uh, they, the study revealed the trade preference index uh, between China and the BRI countries has grown 8% faster than that uh, with the non-BRI countries. So it shows that the effects really are having some impact and that this is not just kind of propaganda, but a, B a BRI, as they say at the end, is acting as a catalyst for intensifying China's bilateral trade preferentiality with China and the BRI countries. So this is again, a, a product of one of those studies. Now I would argue that 2019 was a very big watershed period um, by 2019, a lot of criticism had built up about the BRI. And when Xi Jinping addressed the second Belt and Road Forum, it had become very, very clear that the Chinese leadership had taken very seriously the kind of buildup in this criticism. And in particular, they were criticized for the corruption, for lack of transparency, for the very dominant role played by Chinese companies and a lot of the environmental damage that had been caused. In fact, uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature um, did a study of Pakistan and Sri Lanka and basically expressed great concern about some of the environmental damage that had been done and also about the growing greenhouse emissions uh, that was occurring as a result of the nature of the projects that China had chosen to invest in. And so at this meeting, Xi Jinping promised us uh, three things. Number one, greater transparency, uh, including zero tolerance for corruption. Second, more participation in these projects of the local country uh, business community and the private sector uh, in terms of the buildup of these BRI infrastructure projects. And third, and I think very important, more sustainable debt. Uh, the effort was to reschedule a lot of the debt and so this kind of big financial burden uh, that had been almost imposed on these countries uh, through the so-called preferential borrowing from China uh, wasn't turning out to be a tremendous burden. And uh, China agreed to reschedule a lot of this debt. So um, before 2019, much of this had been focused on traditional infrastructure like high-speed rail, roads, bridges, et cetera. But after 2019, we see more attention to sustainable projects greener projects. There's now more focus on technology oriented, more environmentally friendly projects uh, and uh, projects like 5G, uh, Beidou GPS, green energy, cultural exchanges. Uh, these are becoming much more formalized in terms of the structure of the, of the BRI initiative. This all became uh, even further formalized in the 14th five-year plan. Uh, 14th five-year plan, the uh, you know big document, uh, 19 sections, 65 chapters. Uh, the BRI is discussed in section 12 uh, as part of the discussion about high-level opening cooperation and win-win. And the first thing it tries to do is diversify the number of Chinese players. So, for example, the China Aviation Industry Group starts to become involved in helping to build up the aviation industries in these countries. There's more focus on soft elements like cultural exchange and tourism. There's more inclusion of green uh, uh, and sustainable options. So the green belt and road is given more attention, particularly with respect to climate change, marine conservation, wildlife uh, protection, et cetera. And so um, the whole thing begins to take on a very different complexion. And I think this is part, a product of the fact that there was huge pushback from these countries. And in fact, even today, many of these countries continue to complain to China uh, that if you wanna work with us, uh, we have to have you know, a greater transparency and more a more truly collaborative relationship. And this is what's been going on. 
So let's talk specifically about the science, technology, innovation perspective, because I think this is, as I said, one of the really important parts. Um, the, the BRI these days, as a result of the role of the Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, has now allowed for science, technology, and innovation to play a much more substantial role. In fact, in Nature, uh, which is a very prominent magazine, you know, in the in the world of science, uh, they said that "quote unquote" China's science initiatives under the BRI are redrawing the map of world science. This is a very provocative statement. It means that again, uh, China is bringing into the mainstream of world science countries that might not have even been involved in the global science community, uh, and it's helping to organize exchanges. Uh, it's bringing about collaborative planning. Uh, it's bringing in ministries like the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, uh, to get involved. And it's bringing in other kinds of entities in China, like the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And so now there is a big profound shift uh, that countries, rather than looking to the United States for economic aid or economic assistance, have started now looking to China. And the Chinese now are trying to take advantage that uh, the United States is in sort of a, a plateau. Uh, it's not favored, it's not unfavored, but China, it seems to be on the ascendancy. And particularly after 2019 and the change in its behavior, I think that it has improved its, uh, its, its public relations and it's becoming more well-received overall. And uh, it has continued, particularly uh, since 2016, in defining very specific sets of initiatives uh, that have become uh, you know, very critical, including helping to build science parks, uh, major engineering projects, promoting much more technology transfer. And I think one of the most interesting things is the idea of having 150,000 uh, technology experts from these BRI countries visit China. But like the Chinese found in terms of their own experience of brain drain, they're also finding that uh, they have to promise or commit that these technicians and technical people are going to be uh, told to return to their countries so that these countries don't suffer a brain drain problem as well. And in fact, this is exactly what's been happening. So this also builds good political will, but even more importantly, it helps to create a cadre of technical experts in these countries so that when China goes to implement a project, it has people it can work with who have the expertise to implement these projects very successfully and very efficiently. So uh, I also wanna just say that it's not only at the national level in China, but cities like Tianjin, Shanghai, and Beijing also have their own versions of the Belt and Road Technology and Innovation Cooperation Plans that are, uh, exist under this big national framework. Tianjin is a good example. It has laid out a plan, a 2017 to 2020 plan that just finished its first phase in which it set out also to do all sorts of substantial training, uh, building joint laboratories, 100 and plus joint laboratories, uh, building cooperation between science parks and supporting once again, international technology transfer. So you can see that this is taken on a national purpose but also it has become part of the local level in China where these countries, uh, these uh, cities are looking to play a much more dynamic central role. And this just lays out some of the data. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but it, it basically just uh, uh, reinforces the idea that the level of activity has become much more increased over the last several years, including the buildup of, for example, the China-Kenya Joint Laboratory on Molecular Biology, uh, and other kinds of things that are going on that are uh, uh, similar in all of these different countries. Now, the role of the Chinese Academy of Sciences has taken on special importance. Uh, the CAS now has also become uh, very actively involved in what's called science and technology related education cooperation with the BRI countries. <coughs> Uh, these activities began as early as 2014, but they began to take on greater momentum between 2013 and 2017. And by 2019, the Chinese Academy of Sciences had opened nine training centers across the BIR countries, including a space weather center, an innovation cooperation center in Thailand, and a digital belt and road uh, platform for sharing data. And uh, China's interest in big data 
and gathering data from these countries is also a very, very important part of its interest in working with these uh, different countries. And uh, through the Academy, the Academy then established something called ANSO, the Alliance of International Science Organizations, which now has uh, started off with about uh, uh, 37 different members in 2018. And it's recently added 15 new institutions. Uh, and it's a key part. You can see that uh, uh, throughout the area called the, you know, the land-based Belt and Road, but also including even in Africa, uh, these have become much more prevalent. Uh, and we can see the impact that they're starting to have in terms of Chinese activity. Well, uh, the thing that really takes on greater importance here is that this is not, not simply ivory tower uh, kind of research or uh, uh, research that, uh, you know, as at the high end, What's very important is, for example, things like the tech transfer that's involved in addressing the real problems in these countries, like, for example, the lack of safe drinking water. And China has been engaged in helping to build out infrastructure that is helping to guarantee the availability of safe drinking water in a number of these different countries. And you can see here from this chart that's, uh, that's in place, uh, everything, climate change, natural disaster, uh, combating uh, desertification, energy security, disaster reduction, all of this began to become very, very important as we moved in 2019 into 2020 and the COVID pandemic started to take hold. And China all of a sudden became a very, very important partner uh, because of this. Another part of this Belt and Road is the Chinese relationships with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Again, these are countries that were formerly part of the bloc tied to the former Soviet Union. Uh, there were uh, 17 countries and one international agency. Uh, one, one country recently pulled out, Lithuania, because it, didn't, it felt kind of China was imposing too much of a heavy burden on it. But clearly, uh, this has become now uh, important. Uh, Fudan University is going to build a uh, new university in Hungary as part of this initiative, and it's part of China, you know, expanding its presence in this part of the world. Uh, the members of NATO, including the United States, are very concerned. They think that some of the countries who are also NATO members are being pulled away by China in terms of their loyalty to NATO. So there's an interesting security dimension here uh, that uh, we can also discuss uh, as we look down the road for what this is going to mean overall uh, in a couple of years. So when we do a stock taking of this again, I want to recommend another article that was uh, published in Sustainability, uh, done by three Chinese scholars uh, who looked at the kind of s and cooperation that was taking place between 2000 and 2018. Again, the data came out. Uh, what they've noticed is that, uh, first of all, the number of countries involved in the cooperation with BRI is increasing. Second, they've noticed an increase in the number of partners in terms of a kind of cluster effect. And most important, the center of gravity of cooperation has shifted from west to east, uh, where China now is even surpassing Russia as the per preferred partner for collaboration with these countries. So from a strong west to a weaker east, to now a weak west, and now a stronger east. And among the three countries playing this role, uh, India, China, and Turkey, uh, China obviously is the most prominent and the most active. And China's spatial influence, therefore, we can say, is really having a major impact in terms of Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Central Europe. And we're seeing this being played out every day as these projects begin to increase. Even the city of Xi'an, which we know is in Western China, is now also playing a more strategic role uh, as uh, it's part of Shanxi province and playing a big role in the BRI now has become an official part of the economic development uh, uh, strategy for Xi'an as Xi'an tries to take advantage of its location in this part of the country and this part of the world. So um, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. A key part of this uh, whole initiative is something called the Digital Belt and Road. And people have started to write about this because of, of course they're interested in what China actually has in mind in terms of using its technology, uh, 5G, big data, uh, et cetera, uh, to uh, influence the trajectory of this uh, digital belt and road. 
And um, uh, China clearly is very, very interested in gathering lots of big data in sectors where there's disaster risk, climate, environment risk. And the West is really concerned about this because a lot of these countries are becoming buddy-buddy with Huawei. And obviously, given what's gone on in the relationship between the US and Huawei, they are not anxious to see Huawei secure a strong foothold in this part of the world. So more attention and more focus uh, from the United States about what's been going on. And uh, what's interesting is the Chinese are very, very smart. Uh, what they've done is they've linked their digital belt and road uh, to their efforts that are tied to the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, agricultural security, water resource security, uh, urban and infrastructure development, et cetera, et cetera. And so the sustainable development goals have become an integral part of the BRI priority projects. And uh, that just uh, the other day was reinforced again in China's uh, uh, comments about making the BRI even further green. One of the big parts of this is the remote sensing and the Beidou uh, project. Um, when I arrived at the Duke Kunshan University, the chancellor for DKU was Professor Liu Jingnan. Liu Jingnan was the former president of Wuhan University, but he's also known as the father of Beidou. And uh, during his time as chancellor, um, he only spent 50% of his time uh, as chancellor because the other time he was spent visiting with Xi Jinping, uh, giving him briefings about what was going on with the Beidou system. So this is not an unimportant uh, uh, development. Obviously, having these countries linked uh, primarily into, you can see the blue dots, the China Beidou, as opposed to the red dots, which is the US uh, GPS system, is something that's very important uh, in terms of knowing what's going on in this part of the world. And uh, a Chinese influence, again, is starting to grow in, in very, very pronounced kind of ways. Um, finally, China also has plans for a polar silk road as well. Uh, in 2018, China published a paper, a white paper, announcing plans to pursue what they called a third polar route. Uh, there has been a Northeast passage through Eurasia a Northwest passage through North America. And now they're talking about a passage going through Central Asia, uh, basically based on the fact that because of climate change, the ice caps have started to recede. And as they start to recede, it opens the possibility that ships uh, can travel in these areas and not be affected you know, uh, negatively by the ice flows, et cetera. And in 2022, the Chinese are going to uh, uh, launch a satellite specifically from monitoring and tracking the ice flows so that as they begin to expand the use of the shipping lanes in this part of the world, they can uh, be uh, sure that the ships are uh, going to be safe. Um, two big projects, one with Finland and one with Iceland are examples of China's, you know, putting roots in the ground in this part of the world and helping to establish uh, an Arctic Space Center in Finland and a uh, Arctic Space Ob Science Observatory in Iceland um, as part of their contribution to what's uh, going on in this part of the world. So you can see this is very, very aggressive diplomacy on the part of China. And at the core, as I mentioned, is science and technology, particularly two areas I wanna mention, energy and telecom. I don't have time to cover both of them. Let me just make a few remarks about energy uh, uh, because it's uh, particularly relevant. China has been criticized severely because most of the energy projects that it has engaged in have involved continued reliance on fossil fuel and they've ended up increasing greenhouse uh, emissions. And even though there are some clean energy projects involving wind and solar and even nuclear, the reality is that most of these projects related to uh, what we would call um, uh, dirty energy have been the predominant ones. And so recently you may have heard that the Xi Jinping made an announcement in which he said that China was no longer going to build coal fired plants abroad uh, as part of its effort to uh, rein in uh, the growth of greenhouse emissions and uh, fossil fuel uh, utilization. So you can see here that during this uh, uh, chart, uh, the uh, bulk of projects, particularly early on, well, involved heavy uh, investments in coal um, and also in petroleum. And uh, now that has started to narrow over time and will continue to narrow over time. Too much emphasis on 
uh, fossil fuel need to move away into more renewable energy. And that's the, what the Chinese government now has the, said it was going to do. This takes on really important ramifications because we know one of the hesitancies about these countries is that they want to develop and they say, look, the West went first, China has been next, we want to go and we don't want to constrain our development trajectories because we can't burn you know, uh, certain kinds of fuel, et cetera. China has said it will work with these countries to make sure they have adequate fuel, but that fuel will be clean energy. And I think that that uh, hopefully will be something that the Chinese will continue to, to do. Okay, let me talk quickly about education. Um, this is from the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, um, a professor, uh, Committee of Future Studies, and she says, academic cooperation is a crucial pillar of the relations between China and the CEE countries in the context of the Belt and Road. There's no better way to build trust and understanding than people-to-people -people contact. Uh, besides the cooperation at the academic level, uh, allows the flow of ideas, values, innovation, et cetera, et cetera, and they can benefit from the synergies, build mutual understanding, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is very interesting. This is not a Chinese saying this. This is a, an academic uh, in, in Poland who's talking about what's happening. It's very funny. If you looked at the US uh, uh, literature about US-China relations in the early 80s, it would sound very much the same thing. The United States wanted to foster s and cooperation with China so that it could build trust and mutual understanding. And that's exactly what we did all the way up until the Trump administration. And so now our relationship with China is breaking down in this area. It's remarkable to see how it's being built up with the BRI countries. Now, China has learned a good lesson from the United States, and this is a good example of education diplomacy, including you know, development of relationships. Uh, in 2018, China had almost 500,000 international students, 317,000 of them came from the Belt and Road countries, almost 65% of the countries. So clearly, Belt and Road countries are supplying uh, an important number of students. Uh, China signed uh, uh, about 47 different agreements um, to recognize the higher education degrees that are given on both sides of the borders in terms of its interactions with these countries. So China is now an international education host, but it's also become a facilitator. And this is against the backdrop now of a lots of information we're hearing about the decreasing role of the United States. Um, in terms of education cooperation with China. 14 Chinese provinces now are building a ministerial platform for BRI education cooperation. So this thing is on the move and it's moving very, very fast. And it's even starting to involve the next generation technology such as AI, quantum computing, intelligence systems, et cetera, et cetera. So, in 2016, China's Ministry of Education issued something called the Education Action Plan for the Belt and Road, which was designed to lay out a long-term plan. It, uh, first plan till 2019 was carried out. Uh, China sent about 2,500 students to study in the BRI countries. And it also promised to build 10 uh, overseas technology and education bases to support over 10,000 students. And again, the Chinese goal, not altruism, but clearly, they want to train the talent across these BRI countries so that Chinese sponsored projects can be implemented more effectively and more efficiently. I don't know, it sounds to me like it's a kind of win-win. Um, particularly, of course, Confucius Institutes, which have become accused of being you know, de a den of spies in the United States and, and Europe. The BRI countries seem to welcome uh, the presence of Confucius Institutes. Uh, according to the British Chamber of Commerce, uh, Confucius Institutes have helped the development of a BRI in several different ways. And particularly, BRI countries have become less suspicious of the motives and activities surrounding the CIs than their Western counterparts. And I think this is very interesting. Uh, getting Chinese language proficiency uh, for a number of people in these countries is doing what China wants. It's a form of soft diplomacy, but it's also a form of building trust and understanding so that when Chinese uh, companies participate, uh, they can have a cadre of people with whom they can work with uh, counterparts. 
And these are all, again, different examples. The University Alliance along the Silk Road, it involves 151 different universities across 31 different countries. The Belt and Road University Alliance was started at Lanjo, and now it had 47 members, has grown to 170 members. And the China Central Asia University Alliance, which has 51 universities across seven different uh, countries. So you can see again that this is all uh, very, very big stuff. Okay, let's talk just quickly about the China's health diplomacy and COVID. Um, before the pandemic, there was something called the Health Silk Road, but it only had a marginal role among all the BRI uh, parts. It didn't play the kind of significant role that it has started to play today. Uh, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs said that health cooperation, uh, because it was already there, it helped China to react quickly. And China then built up its stock uh, because as the COVID pandemic began to build, China began to build out its um, infrastructure in terms of working with these countries. And right now, China is talking about a post-pandemic era where it's going to focus more and more on health, uh, green economy and sustainability and health is going to be one of the attractive areas where they are uh, going to invest a lot of money. Uh, the Ali group, Alibaba, uh, was, has been widely involved in these BRI projects and the Ma Yun Foundation basically has sent out lots of aid uh, and assistance uh, to fight COVID uh, to these countries, including 100,000 face masks, gowns, testing kits. Uh, these were sent, for example, to Nigeria. Uh, from the, from the uh, Ma Yun Foundation. So this is all very important. And many of the BRR countries now are using the Chinese vaccine, uh, like the United Arab Emirates, uh, which was uh, you know, first approved within China and now has made its way to this part of the world. So where does that leave us? There are a number of issues obviously out there regarding the BRI. As I tried to make clear, the Chinese have changed their posture but it doesn't mean that this is all being done with great deal of altruism. First of all, China has to clean up the legacy of the debt trap diplomacy that was created during the early phases of the BRI initiative. Uh, a number of countries have a worsening debt problem and China is going to have to do something about it to reschedule the debt. Second, as Xi Jinping promised, the BRI had lacked transparency, which then led to corruption and payoffs and bribery. Uh, China has now uh, made a major commitment uh, to eradicate these problems and improve on past performance. Um, third, the BRI projects were harming the environment. And again, one of the big areas where this criticism was, I mentioned the China-Pakistan before, uh, the ecological loss has been very, very high, and China now has promised to clean up some of the messes. So clearly there's a legacy that China must deal with in terms of what it did before. So it can only do so much good going forward if it cleans up the mess that it created at the very beginning of this. And I think one of the things that had happened was that, you, as you may know, you know, sometimes the center in China doesn't have as much control over the localities. Uh, and in many cases, a lot of entities went out and went forth into these BRI countries and were not sanctioned and were not monitored and were not assessed uh, by the central government. I think we're starting to see more central government uh, uh, oversight to make sure these projects don't end up causing China uh, diplomacy. And so, you know, the big question out there is, you know, uh, is this really going to be a win-win strategy and uh, of mutual benefit, or is it just aspirational? Is it something that the Xi Jinping has said, but it doesn't carry much weight? And I think the fact that Xi Jinping has taken the lead in admonishing his colleagues uh, that they need to improve is an indicator that it's going to be taken much more serious. Now, the BRI is not the only project out there. There are a number of parallel or alternative projects. Um, there's one called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership involving Europe. Uh, there's a Eurasia Economic Union involving Russia. Uh, Kazakhstan has its own project called the Bright Road Initiative, et cetera, et cetera. But as I indicate here, most of these projects are merely complementary to the main big BRI initiative. But they do coexist and they are important. And they do basically um, uh, try to indicate that China is not simply dominating the terrain. Uh, it's allowing, uh, when well, it doesn't, it's not its choice, but it's basically uh, uh, not blocking any of these projects from, from moving ahead. 
Now, the big question, of course, is what is the United States going to do? And this is from um, a, a copy of Bloomberg News. It says that Washington is dismissing China's Belt and Road, and that's a huge strategic mistake. And I think one of the reasons why the Council on Foreign Relations did its study is simply because I think China was spending more and more time and attention and resources on BRI, and the United States didn't seem to have its own plan and didn't seem to have a strategy, e even if it was to counter China's influence in BRI, the United States had not paid a lot of attention to that part of the world, except for example, Afghanistan uh, to, to fight uh, you know, Osama bin Laden and, uh, and, uh, and the Taliban uh, when, uh, when that came in, but that's, that's over now. So uh, the Biden administration uh, with the G7 launched something called the uh, Build Back Better World. Uh, using a uh, uh, euphemism that the Biden administration has used. Uh, if Trump wants to make America great again, Biden wants to build back better. And uh, that's his, uh, his thing that he's uh, uh, putting forward. So uh, Biden's goal is to rally the world's democracies, to deliver for our people and meet the challenges of the world and demonstrate our shared values. Um, and so this is a very political response to what uh, China has been doing in this part of the world. Uh, the key question, is this real or is this just a type of counter China diplomacy uh, that's simply designed to show up, uh, but rather than really take a serious interest in the development trajectory of this part of the world? And I think that's a very legitimate question uh, to ask. What is the U.S. interest in really doing something serious other than countering China? So as we look forward into this, let me leave you with some thoughts. First of all, I think we have to understand that the BRI is not just a, a vision that was articulated by Xi Jinping as part of the so-called great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, but it's also designed to be a mutually beneficial path for shared prosperity with the countries along the BRI. This is not simply a only a development initiative. It's a foreign policy initiative. It's a trade initiative. It has many different dimensions to it. Second of all, it's an evolving vision. Uh, even though it involves the so-called Chinese dream, um, the Chinese dream now is also linked back to a regional dream and even a global dream as part of the role that China will play in the world in the coming years during the 21st century and beyond. Third, as I mentioned before, there is no clear line geographically that defines the limits or the extent of the BRI. It is a very fluid concept. Um, and a lot of people think, well, you know, the BRI, this is a scheme for Chinese global domination uh, because it's a pathway for extending Chinese influence and prestige. It may be the latter, but it doesn't seem to be the former. I don't think it really has the earmarks of a scheme for global domination, but clearly it's a part of the world where China wants to increase its influence and prestige, and I think it's having some degree of success. And finally, as the trade war with the United States has gone forward, the BRI concept has added much more value for China. The more difficult it is to deal with the West, the more China wants to have a path of less resistance, the more it's going to want to deal with the BRI countries. But there's a proviso that I want to add, and I think this is very, very important for us to recognize. China has two aspirations. As I said before, it wants to enhance its political influence uh, and economic activity across the world, and especially in the BRI. But it also has a desire for its domestic science and technology capabilities and the buildup of its e elite universities like Tsinghua and Beida to attain levels of excellence that are associated with its Western counterparts in the US, Western Europe, and Japan. And as it becomes much more enamored with working with the BRI countries, it also has to recognize that by working increasingly with the BRI countries, it's not getting any kind of real meaningful contribution in terms of its efforts to reach high level science and technology uh, achievement or to build out these world-class universities. In fact, one could make the argument that the more resources that are devoted to the BRI, in some way detracts from China's ability uh, to uh, engage with Western science and engage with Western education. So China is going to have to somehow find the right balance in terms of engagement. And we know the term walking on two legs is a very kind, common Chinese term, but I think it really is applicable here. 
that uh, China wants to engage with BRI clearly because it's a unique and huge opportunity for it to exert and extend its influence and uh, become a win-win proposition. But it also knows that it must figure out a way how to work with the West, and it must figure out a way how to uh, collaborate with uh, Europe, Japan, and the United States. And so this really is the dilemma that Xi Jinping faces as he looks ahead. Uh, good opportunity in BRI, but also lots of challenges in terms of figuring out how to work with the United States. And so as we look forward, uh, the BRI is going to continue to be highly pluralistic. It's going to have both a bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. Uh, the shift in 2019 was very politically important. I think the shift also encompassed this move from traditional infrastructure to more sustainable uh, focus in, in all of these countries. Um, and that right now there are no rival plans coming from the West that can compete effectively with BRI. There's no valid alternative being offered. And the question is how long is the United States gonna wait Till it really does something much more significant in this part of the world. So I will leave you with that uh, idea in mind, and I'm more than willing to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, thank you so much for providing us so many great ideas regarding China's SMT uh, trend trajectories, and also especially the role of SNT in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and also pose a lot of new questions and debate as well uh, in this field. Um, so I think um, I, um, when the audience is still uh, are typing their questions in the Q&A box, I think I will start with um, a little bit more general question to uh, continue with the conversation of where China right now in terms of their SNT uh, uh, positions and their ambitions uh, or the, the stages, because I still remember uh, vividly when we have this, this uh, conversations at one of your class at Penn State about 10 years ago, uh, <laughs> we would discuss about China going through uh, different stages from uh, uh, things that are opening up and, and then become a more indigenous oriented and then uh, right now is uh, made in China 2025. As so we can see, the trajectory is moving more and more towards uh, this uh, techno nationalism kind of uh, directions. Uh, but we have a debate, like at the Penn State, whether uh, what is the next stage for China's NCT in general. And the, I think at that time, we don't have the conclusions, big solid conclusions, as right. China has already reached the stage of. Uh, techno-nationalism, but given so much efforts China being done and uh, the uh, influence uh, overseas and uh, uh, the competitions with the US, and uh, what do you think whether we can say China right now is at the stage of techno-nationalism? Uh, and if it's, if it's so, so what is the main overarching uh, force behind uh, this uh, trajectories for, for, for China? Okay, uh, good, good question. Um, you know, if you look at the speeches made by Chinese leaders, and particularly, of course, Xi Jinping, there is a constant uh, theme about remaining open for international engagement. And so I don't think China is about to close the door, nor do I think that China wants to close the door. I think one of the ironies of the current stance of the United States right now is that our foreign policy towards China, starting with the normalization of relations, was designed to bring China into the mainstream of world economic and uh, cultural affairs, as well as science and technology affairs. And for most of the 1980s, 1990s, and even to the point after China joined the WTO, uh, that seemed to be our policy, including the notion of making China into a responsible stakeholder in terms of the international system. But right now with the constraints that we're placing on China in terms of its access to technology, technologies that today are the building block technologies of the new digital economies, things like semiconductors, for example, um, we are basically putting China into a corner where it now has to really think about the need to become more self-reliant. And this posture of greater self-reliance is it runs 180 degrees opposite of where the United States had wanted China to be in terms of why it normalized relations and what it did for almost four decades to continue to uh, attract it to become more of a mainstream player. 
Um, I, I get worried about this because I don't want to see another bifurcation of the world economy. I don't want to see, for example, China and the BRI countries and a number of other countries uh, be in one you know, uh, um, a scheme where they adopt certain technical standards and Huawei technology is the prevalent technology, et cetera, et cetera. And then the rest of the world is in another direction. Mm -hmm. I think that is in everyone's interest to begin to work together. And I think that we're making a mistake by uh, talking the language of decoupling and therefore creating some techno-nationalistic streams within China that now have started to become much more pronounced. And um, I wrote an article a couple of months ago uh, in which I said that one could imagine how Japan felt in the 1930s when the Japanese were being denied access to natural resources and petroleum uh, by Western countries. And that ended up resulting in the uh, Pacific War where Japan obviously attacked the United States. And uh, uh, the main thrust of the Japanese effort was to keep open its access to raw materials to drive the, Chinese, uh, drive the Japanese economy. Well, in 2021, uh, oil and uh, natural resources are being replaced by semiconductors, digital technology, AI. These are the new building blocks of the digital economy. And if you're denying China access, not only to the chips, but also to the equipment that manufactures these chips, and also you're not even allowing for the training of young Chinese in double E programs and things of that sort, then China feels that it's being held hostage you know, to the whims of the United States. So I, I'm not sure what the end game is for the United States. Does it simply want to see the Chinese economy crash and burn? Or uh, does it want to just simply slow down the Chinese economy? Um, because I think that uh, I would not bet against China. Uh, I, my, my good sense of 40 years of engagement with China tells me that uh, don't bet against China. If there's a will, there's a way. It may not be a smooth, easy way, but I think that um, Chinese leaders recognize that they must uh, come up with better solutions to the current situation. Um, uh, because if the United States keeps pushing hard, uh, China is going to be faced with a dilemma uh, and means go at it alone. And uh, that's not going to be good for the world. Yeah, sure. I completely agree with that. Um, so I would like to encourage the audience to post your questions on uh, at the Q&A box. And uh, meanwhile, uh, I would like to uh, continue with what Dennis just said. Uh, actually, this, uh, for example, the Huawei ban is not just a corner China. Uh, in a certain ways, and also it's a back, backfires uh, for US as well. And because of the chip, chip shortage uh, is caused by uh, this initial Huawei ban. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, we are kind of also from US perspective, we also understand that uh, US has this kind of uh, continuing have this uh, sense of uh, uh, insecure and also worries looking at uh, China's uh, promoting its own technology standards of 5G uh, uh, not only on the Built and Road Initiative, but also uh, worldwide. So uh, especially uh, the, the private sector and the Chinese government work uh, uh, very closely together. And then uh, they, they are trying to uh, change the rules and the regulations uh, in terms of that. And the US definitely has a sense of very uh, 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 strong uh, concerns uh, towards that. Um, but but uh, apparently uh, the, the, the policy that was uh, uh, developed by uh, the Trump's administration was uh, 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 was very extreme and as I said, it's a backfire U.S. itself. But uh, what kind of U.S. in your point of view for for U.S. policy, if it's shifting a little bit, and also how exactly uh, U.S. Uh, policy makers they should adjust a little bit in terms of to you know, not just uh, um, uh, try to, well, I understand is try to interrupt this, this kind of relationship between Chinese government and the private sector work together to change the rules, but also at the same time, uh, not to uh, completely break the game and uh, in the end, uh, both sides lose, right? What kind of uh, adjust, adjustment or policy changes uh, in your point of view, US should take? Uh, regarding China's rise uh, and also uh, ambitions in changing uh, um, the rules of the game. Right, right. Well, you know, I mean, it's a, we, we're living in an interesting moment because over the last uh, six months, 
um, uh, the Chinese government's policies towards the so-called uh, private sector, and particularly what we thought of as the cutting edge, you know, Alibaba, uh, Baidu, Tencent, uh, Didi, uh, all of the Waimai, uh, uh, Shindongfang, you know, the New Oriental, all of this crackdown on all of these different kind of companies, one would say, well, look at this, uh, the, 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 the one part of the Chinese economy that the West really liked working with and really thought was the going to be the face of the new China, the new Chinese economy, the new digital Chinese economy even. Um, now that has been cracked down on, and, and not only in a minor way, but a rather serious way. And Xi Jinping, uh, by the use of terms like common prosperity and uh, dual circulation and et cetera, et cetera, is now seemingly concerned with uh, changing the face of that uh, economy away from these types of companies uh, and much more in the direction of hardware companies, companies that produce you know, chips, uh, companies that produce computers, you know, companies that produce radars, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and not companies that are simply living on uh, business model innovation. So I think that uh, the relationship, particularly, of course, uh, the biggest uh, lightning rod for all of this has been Jack Ma and uh, Ma Yun. And uh, uh, of course, uh, he has now... Uh, uh, taken on a much lower profile. Um, and the Chinese government, you know, is worried that uh, uh, these entrepreneurs who've been very successful uh, have become like a group of oligarchs, uh, like the Russian oligarchs. And clearly Xi Jinping does not want to see an alternative locus of authority and influence appear in the Chinese economy. Now for the United States, you know, this is sort of bad news. It affects investors. It also has meant a huge crackdown uh, on terms of Chinese investment in the United States. I just read the UNCTAD uh, foreign investment report for 2020, and it said that the number of Chinese M&A activity has been the lowest across the last 10 years uh, this past year. And so, of course, some of it can be attributed to uh, COVID, but the bulk of it is attributed to the fact of the political constraints now being imposed. Now, some of this is deserved. Chinese companies lack transparency. The Chinese government didn't allow them to share data, et cetera, et cetera. And so if they want to play in the United States, they got to play by the American rules. Uh, China can't assert its extraterritoriality in America, just like America can't assert its extraterritoriality in China. And I think this is something that uh, both sides need to recognize. I'm, I continue to be a bit worried because the Biden administration has not shown a big inclination to show a sharp departure from the policies of the Trump administration. It has seemed to follow suit. Now, what we're hearing and uh, you know, here on the East Coast is that, oh, well, well, the Biden administration is engaged in a big review of China policy, and they're starting to put together the pieces of a new China policy, and that very shortly we'll hear that. And before that, they're not going to take any major initiative towards China because they're not sure of what the outcome of that policy will be, new policy will be, and therefore they don't want to do something inconsistent up front in order to solve a short-term problem that might create longer-term problems. But most people are just waiting for this new China policy, are waiting, and they continue to wait. I'm, I'm one of these people that said, you know, I can't think of a higher priority right now than to get the China policy right. I think that that takes on one of the highest, if not the highest level priority for this administration. And the reason is very simple. There is not a global problem out there, particularly ones related to climate change, global pandemics, clean energy, et cetera, that will not require some form of close collaboration between the United States and China. And that if you want to solve these problems, you're going to need substantial collaboration between these two countries. And if these two countries can't work together, I don't think there's much hope that we're going to come up with a solution uh, to climate change or any of these other related problems. And we saw how difficult it was uh, during the COVID pandemic when they didn't work together so well uh, what happened uh, very, very quickly in terms of the spread of the, of the uh, virus and uh, uh, subsequent the numbers of deaths. Now, of course, the U.S. bears, the U.S. policy under the Trump administration bears tremendous responsibility for the numbers of deaths that actually have occurred. But nonetheless, 
you know, I would make the argument um, that the United States has to figure out a way how to work with China. And that's going to mean a very different perspective on the part of this administration. And that perspective means that the United States and China have to figure out that they're going to both be at the table of rule making uh, now that the, no longer is China at the side table or the kids table or some out of the room. China is right front and center right across from the United States. And as the Chinese officials told uh, Secretary of State Blinken um, in Alaska, you can't dictate to us anymore. You know, your house is not in perfect order. You have no moral ethical high ground in which to claim that somehow you have a um, uh, a right to, to do this. And I think that the Chinese, frankly, were legitimate in what they said. You know, uh, the US needs to be careful about lecturing others and uh, China needs to be careful about ignoring uh, the rules of the game. And uh, I think uh, if China shows a greater inclination uh, to be this responsible stakeholder, uh, but you may know in the, at the meeting in Glasgow that just occurred, uh, Xi Jinping was a no-show. He didn't show up. This was a big expectation. You know, the head of uh, France, Macron, uh, supposedly spoke to Xi Jinping um, a few days before the meeting. She told him he would be there and make a big commitment, and it wasn't there. So a lot of people left the meeting very uneasy. Um, it's this kind of uh, problem that can't keep going on and on as the problems of the, the globe continue to grow and fester uh, because the world will suffer. The world, the interesting thing is that not only do the US and China benefit from working together, the world benefits from them working together. And if they don't work together, the world suffers. So there are greater stakes than just the people in our two countries. There's a global interest here that needs to be taken into account. Yeah, both sides I need to make some efforts and then make some behavior change or at, at, or at least attitude change. And instead of have this uh, Cold War mind setting, um, it's better to recap lane and see what kind of solutions or uh, uh, complements they can do instead of uh, uh, decoupling towards that road. Exactly, um, exactly. I think I have a, a set of uh, questions from the audience. First of all, from Professor Bo Kong, and uh, he's asking, when you explain that the uh, Belt and Road Initiative enhanced China's uh, political influence, how do you define uh, such influence? And uh, how is it different from uh, uh, penetrate into penetrations into local markets or growing uh, presence in trade, investment, or aid? And can you provide a concrete example of uh, BRI uh, giving China's more influence? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a very interesting example. Um, this year, I applied to be a Fulbright specialist. And as a senior scholar, a Fulbright specialist gets selected to go to different countries on specific projects. And the, one of the projects this year is being sponsored by the country of Estonia, okay? By the Foreign Policy Institute in Estonia. And what is that project? The project is to work together with Estonian officials and scholars to figure out how to reduce Chinese influence on the Estonian economy coming through the Belt and Road. So here's a country that clearly <laughs> is feeling the brunt of this excessive influence. And the influence appears at multiple levels. So let me tell you, first of all, it appears at the technical level. So if, uh, if Huawei and uh, ZTE and uh, uh, a couple of other companies from China are there trying to sell their wares and Ericsson and Siemens uh, are not there, that means that uh, um, uh, the Chinese influence is going to grow uh, in a technical sense because the, the, the items that are being sold, the standards for setting up the systems are all going to be influenced heavily by China. So technical areas is where one area of, of great influence. Economic area uh, is another area. The Chinese you know, promised to bring with them investment, uh, investment not only in infrastructure as we've discussed, um, but now commercial investments uh, of different sorts. And uh, of course, uh, these economies want to uh, have jobs and want to create uh, 
uh, catalyst for economic growth. Uh, and therefore, China also has influence on the economic trajectory of these countries. And some of them feel uh, that it's a little bit uh, too much uh, uh, to occur. And in terms of political influence, of course, um, when you have this technical and economic influence, um, if you try to deviate in your behavior uh, by becoming closer, let's say, to the United States or closer to Western Europe, um, the Chinese begin to say, well, you know, you know that uh, loan you took maybe we won't reschedule it. You know that uh, project we talked about, you know, the price has just gone up. Um, you know so-and-so that's going on. In other words, there are all sorts of ways for China to leverage um, its influence in ways that, uh, you know, uh, try to benefit itself. Now, Xi Jinping realizes that this is a short-term, you know, way to solve the problem because long-term, it will create a lot of animosity and a lot of enemies. Uh, and that's why I think that since 2019, there's been an ex accelerated effort um, to improve the way China interacts with these countries. But still, nonetheless, you know, China is trying to uh, gain influence over this part of the world. So China is the preferred partner and that economic choices, technological choices, even cultural choices, like I said about Confucius Institutes are being made with a positive image of China in mind. This is the extreme um, assertion of soft diplomacy getting played out. And I would argue increasingly successfully after a first phase of BRI that wasn't as successful as the Chinese had hoped. And so we're seeing a kind of return uh, to the game, but with a new set of rules and a new set of strategies about how to win in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Professor Bo, I also have a following question. Uh, has there an, an ins uh, instinct, uh, instance that China has uh, activated its leverages, uh, uh, leverage zone? And let's see. So um, I was just in Greece uh, 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 10 days ago. And of course, uh, you may know that uh, uh, China has invested in Piraeus, which is the, the Greek mm -hmm. port off of Athens. Um, and I, last summer, I was in Iceland. Um, and, uh, of course, the Chinese have a big embassy there. And uh, I wonder wonders why they have such a big embassy in a country that has so few people. And that's because uh, there's really rich deposits of iron ore uh, in this part of the world. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, very clear uh, that uh, if China has an interest, it's going to assert that interest and try to make something, uh, something happen. I don't see necessarily a what I would call uh, uh, a negative, a big negative case. Uh, but one thing that has, uh, has some people concerned, let me put it this way, is that the Biden Build Back Better World is a, is, is a model that talks about the spread of democracy and the protection of human rights. Uh, and as we know, uh, China has interested in, in much more the material side of the equation and is not so concerned with um, change, uh, regime change in these countries, is not concerned with human rights protection in these countries. And so this is an area that in fact might get sacrificed. China's interest is in stability. And whether it's a democracy or authoritarian, it wants to have a long-term sustainable relationship with the decision makers in these countries. So it will support any regime uh, it doesn't go in like the United States has been accused of, of saying, well, you know, you must promote democracy, you must promote, you know, uh, uh, voting, uh, you must promote uh, multiple political parties, et cetera, et cetera. That's just not a Chinese requirement. Um, and we know that a number of countries, and particularly the heads of these countries, uh, like working with the Chinese in that sense. But I think that what we have seen from the first phase up to 2019, is a pushback, a very hard pushback by the countries saying, we're not going to, we don't want to get trapped into this debt, debt uh, uh, trap. We don't want to basically become solely dependent on you. We want a much more open economic and technological opportunity. And we're hoping that uh, as we go forward, uh, we don't mind working with you, but we don't want to be a zero one game. It's either all China or nobody. Uh, we want to have multilateral relationships, not simply a bilateral relationship. 
And I think that's the, the, the case for Estonia is so interesting yes. that that's a Fulbright project that they've asked the US scholar to go out and help them with uh, because they must feel a tremendous burden uh, in order to get out from the under of the Chinese influence. Mm -hmm. It's also uh, interesting that for, as you said, in Iceland, that for uh, such a, a small, uh, well, well, relatively small country, but that China has a big embassy over there. Yeah, um, re, re, yeah I, I, wonder, I wondered about this. And so I did some, I did some asking around and uh, that's what I found out. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's clear, and I told you they built a new science center there. And uh, Iceland, you know, may turn out to be a strategic partner uh, to China. Now, you know, if nothing, if nothing negative occurs in a place like Iceland, because Iceland is a democracy and people vote, and uh, uh, Chinese influence doesn't take a bad turn, mm -hmm. it could could work out very, very well. Um, and I think that we need to watch those cases where there's a win-win outcome that occurs versus a win-lose outcome, or at least a negative outcome of some sort. I'm, I'm not prepared to say that this is all great stuff and it's you know, all going to turn out to be hunky-dory for everybody. I think that uh, uh, the good news is China has turned a page on the way that it was behaving in terms of BRI. It mm -hmm. got the lesson, it got the message, but I want to see it now follow through on all of these projects and uh, see if that goodwill and trust that it intends to build actually gets built out. And mm -hmm. that's why this is a... Uh, a work in progress. That's why I said it's still fluid. It's not a, the final vision or the final page has yet to be written. But do you see uh, China's diplomatic approach in, uh, has been changing a little bit? Uh, because you mentioned yet US, when US giving out uh, foreign aid is actually uh, uh, targeting uh, in terms of targeting changing in terms of uh, uh, regime type and um, towards more democratic uh, transition. And then China's more material oriented, but do you see a change in the Chinese uh, overseas influence? And they also uh, try to uh, explore the Chinese model or Chinese characteristic uh, 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 kind of development, especially in the Africa countries. Do you see yeah. that that kind of change mm -hmm. and uh, how how that affect um, um, in terms of uh, you know the recipient countries their public opinions uh, towards China's uh, uh, attempt uh, influence. Sure. So you would, uh, some people might even call it a form of cultural imperialism or you know, mm -hmm. Han chauvinism. You know, uh, uh, when, when the Chinese invest in a number of these African countries, uh, because the countries don't have big talent pools and because they don't have, in many cases, very strong universities, there's large numbers of Chinese workers, large numbers of Chinese technicians that are sent there and there are many Chinese villages and cities created. Um, and in fact, there are shopkeepers and restaurants and laundries and whatever else, uh, Chinese buying and selling to each other. Uh, and uh, there is a question of, uh, even though there's a big Chinese presence, what's the impact, the net contribution uh, to the developing country that they're operating in? And so that is some of the criticism uh, that came from at least phase one. I think that uh, China has taken note of that. Um, and that's why the uh, plan to include more local participation, uh, contribute to the development of more uh, commercial businesses in these African countries and start to see that uh, this is not just a one-way street. So I think that uh, you know, China, uh, some of the people who are engaged in these projects um, uh, are not uh, culturally sophisticated. I understand why they, in effect, create Chinese ghettos in many cases. Um, uh, some of it has to do with security, as well as it has to do with just comfort levels. Um, but I think China has to learn how to be much more global uh, by being able to deal with diversity uh, in the world in, in a much more pronounced way. It's the same thing with the international students when they come to a Chinese university. Um, I think the international students in Chinese universities, uh, while they like the fact that they may have a little bit better living quarters and better food, they also want to be mainstreamed in these universities. They don't want to simply live with other international students. They want to work and live and collaborate with Chinese students as well. So I think this is a, a something that the China as a culture is so homogeneous uh, that it finds it very difficult to 
uh, open up to others from other cultures. It's not as uh, uh, rigid as Japan, uh, but it's uh, still, you know, the idea of Waigoren or Lao Wai or Yang Guizhi or Da Biza. Uh, these are people coming from the outside, you know, and so while China is much more cosmopolitan today than it was, you know, 50 years ago, uh, the reality is that China still is a very tight, homogeneous society. And uh, Han Chinese, you know, and make up 98% of, of the population. Um, uh, it's, it's just something that China has to get much more of a comfort level with if it's going to become really and truly a global uh, power. And if it's going to have global influence, it's going to have to learn how to live and work with others in ways that it, it hasn't done so before. Thank you. Uh, last question, we're going to uh, wrap up our uh, events today. So as a, uh, you as a uh, global scholars and also advisor, so if uh, tomorrow I ask you to give uh, one uh, advisor or suggestion to Xi Jinping and also to Biden, uh, what uh, the top uh, priority uh, 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 suggestion you will give to both of them? Okay, well, I would just say, I don't mean to be nasty, but stop the bullshit. You know, this kind of, <laughs> It really is the, the kind of finger pointing that goes on uh, between the two countries, the kind of gamesmanship that's going on. Um, I think that there are two things that have to occur. One, embrace climate change problem as a number one uh, priority uh, for uh, each of you and uh, uh, build some trust to work together on this because that needs their uh, uh, collaboration very badly. And number two, stop messing around with Taiwan. Um, uh, the idea that somehow uh, uh, all of this activity can occur and there's not going to be some accident or some kind of uh, a problem emerge from it is, uh, is very unlikely. And I think we're gonna wake up one morning uh, just like we did a number of years ago with the EP3 incident off of a Hainan Island. And we're gonna have you know, a US uh, plane and a, a PRSA plane or a Taiwan plane you know, smack one to one another and we're gonna have a real problem at stake. Um, it's too much gamesmanship, uh, it's too much going on. I think that both countries have to stop this. Um, and I think uh, my sense of things about Taiwan, just not to change the subject from where we are, but is that uh, the status quo will be perfectly fine for most people on Taiwan if neither side disrupts it. So let's not disrupt it. Let's just keep the status quo. So one, uh, climate change, embrace it and as a problem, and two, stop messing around with the Taiwan problem. If I could tell, them, tell him those two things, that's what I would do. Thank you so much, Dennis. I'm really honored and pleasant to have you today. And uh, thank you so much for your talk and discussions. And uh, we're looking forward to have you on campus uh, in the future. Okay. Okay, that sounds great. And uh, uh, let's keep talking. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you again on another project in the future. Take thank care now. So and thank you, uh, Professor Go, uh, Bo Kung, okay, as well. Good night now. Good night, thank you.